Hello and welcome to my website, Born in Hell. Uh, my name is Laurie Smith. I am a child abuse survivor. Um, I really am just a public speaking advocate, speaking out against child abuse, standing up for child rights. Just a voice for survivors out here whose voices have been silenced. Um, you know, uh, spreading you know information, really public information regarding child abuse, just so that it doesn't get shoved back under the carpet. So thanks everybody for joining me. This is a video series. I'm actually finishing up the last few videos that are left. I want to just to present this information so that people will understand what it is to be abused if they don't know the, the, how hard it is to overcome abuse of any type. Um, adult survivor issues that can be really difficult to navigate through life with, and especially if we don't get help. Right? And I just wanted to let people know um, I share my story really mainly because of my brother's um, two of my brothers killed themselves in their early 30s to mid 30s uh, because of the abuse they suffered. They had other issues, drug abuse mainly. They, they were both suicidal. They both had no desire to live. And they both grew up in the same house I did. And I was heading that way for so many years. And, um, you know, I just wanted to be really not speak, not be their voice, but tell their story and let the world know that abuse is wrong. And people need to stop looking at abuse as, as just discipline. And people need to start paying attention when you know to the issues that children are being abused right under your nose, man. It's either happening in your own home, it's happening around you, it's happening next door. It could be happy if you live in an apartment complex, it could be happening above, below. And unless you know the signs and symptoms and you know what to look for and you care about children, they're just gonna die. And if they don't, they're going to end up like the 60, actually well, 250 billion trillion survivors out here who made it, who didn't get killed and end up in the morgue, um, who then have to try to navigate life. And some have a harder time than others, for sure. It depends on the amount of help that people get. So this is why I'm doing this. So thanks, everybody. We're looking at years 30 through 31. And uh, this is graphic, very explicit material. It's very sensitive material. And, you know, I'm just presenting the truth. I want people to know the truth. I wrote my books. This is all sort of based on a life of death and redemption. My book that I wrote, which is a truthful account of what my family suffered in this abusive, domestic violence, dysfunction, mental illness, psychological illness situation that I grew up in. So looking at it from my eyes, it's only one point of view. But I am being very, very honest about the details. And anybody who wants to check my check up, could check up and they would find out that it is all 100% accurate, including my stuff. I'm telling on myself in <laughs> a lot of it. So, you know, I'm being honest, right? And I just want people to know because um, child abuse so many times gets just shoved under the carpet. People knew what was happening in our house. They knew the dysfunction, but they loved my mother so much. And, you know, they, they didn't care what was going on with the kids. The kids were just losers, my older brothers and stuff, you know, they were just losers. And I was just this little brat that needed to be spanked or beat on. They were always saying, somebody smack that brat to me. And then my mom would. She was already beating on me. She didn't need an excuse. Um, I was just looked at as this bratty kid who needed to be put in line all the time. Putting in line by my mom's standards meant beating with uh, incredibly hard implements. She liked to beat me with uh, heavy things. And the belt. But I got mainly a lot of uh, the really damaging stuff was from really heavy objects or her fists. And my mom, when I was growing up, I was a little tiny little kid. My mom was around 250 to 280 pounds, about 11 and a half feet tall. Very big woman, uh, very tall, very strong. Um, she wasn't a tiny little mousy woman. And um, she hurt me <laughs> incredibly bad. But not only that, but she allowed my brother to rape me as a child, eight years old. She did nothing to stop it. She turned a blind eye. I see nothing. I know nothing. Right? And, um, and then took no responsibility for it later. And didn't get me any hospitalization. You know, there was no charges. I mean, my brother was just shipped off to Canada to get him out of the house, right? So, you know, he was 13 years older than me. I was eight years old. What was I supposed to do? So, you know, you can go back and watch my videos, but I'm now 30, 31, and I'm just presenting this material as it is. So it's very graphic. It's very detailed. 
you have to listen at your own discretion. If you think the topics of abuse are going to bother you, please don't watch. Please don't listen to any of my stuff because anything to do with the child abuse stuff. I do a lot of biblical work. I have an associate's in biblical studies with honors. I'm working on a bachelor of ministry right now. And I would like to go on and get a master's degree. I want to get two master's degrees and then a doctorate. So I've got a ways to go. But um, I love to share God's word. And so I do a lot of Bible studies. Those are fine to listen to. I'm not talking so much about abuse in those. But um, I'm talking about the human heart in those. That's right. But uh, I'm talking about abuse here. And anything I have your child abuse stuff on, if you, if you think the topics of abuse will bother you, you know, you wouldn't be hurting my feelings if you didn't watch or listen, right? You have to do what's best for you. And you have to make that decision yourself. Only you can do that. You have to make the right decision for yourself. And if you're a survivor, you know, on your healing journey, and you're not sure how far along enough you are in your healing journey, whether you can handle this type of information or not, or it's going to trigger you and cause you to go back in your healing journey backwards, right? You don't want to do that. You know, make sure you're strong enough and feeling, you know, safe enough that you can listen to another survivor's story without it causing you to trigger and go backwards, right, in your healing journey. Please don't do that. And, um, you know, be very careful. Young people, 18 and under, I ask that you have adult, uh, adult, some sort of parental adult consent to listen to my stuff. Have a teacher listen to it if you trust a teacher. Somebody who can help you make the decision whether you should be listening to it age appropriately, right? Because I'm not sure how young people are that will be listening. And I say this on all of my work, on all of my shows, as you notice, I do a little introduction because um, many times people will not watch the first introductory video. They go along and they pick a video in the middle because they're not sure what it's about. And if I don't put this on here, people don't have a clue what I'm doing. And they also are not, you know, given fair warning about what the material is going to be covering. Right. So it's a bit repetitive. But thanks, everybody. We're we're moving right on in. 30, 31. My mom just died. You know, um, she was very sick. 30 or 38 years older than me. I'm 30. Um, you know, she I just turned 30, actually, a few months ago. And uh, she's 38 years older than me. She's 68 years old. So she died. Her health was so bad for so many years. I never knew her to be well. And, um, you know, I came from Canada. I just, uh, in January, lost my baby. Midterm, halfway, went into labor, full labor. Aborted the baby because it, my body kicked the baby out. I was told I would probably never have children, never because of the scar tissue, because of child rape, um, incest by my brother. And so, you know, I didn't think I could get pregnant. I didn't think I'd be able to carry a baby, right? So I thought by some miracle, if it ever happened, it'd be a great thing. I was really looking forward to being a mother. So I lost my baby. That dream's gone. Another puff of smoke dream, gone. Right? I leave the guy who is the father, who is of this baby, uh, this man that I've been with for not even a year. I leave him because he wasn't there for me. I'm gone. He was working up north, 2,000 miles north. <laughs> and the, the, the charter flight would have probably cost three grand, three grand. We didn't have that kind of money. He couldn't get home to be with me. I was being very unrealistic and un, uh, unwilling to bend because of my abuser, my, my, my adult survivor issues, right? Which I have no clue about right now. I'm 30 years old. I know that I'm screwed up from the abuse because I've never, I've never been in denial about it. I put it in drawers and I put it away for a while. You can go back and watch my videos. Right? I put the abuse away so I can deal. Just so that I don't go kill myself. Because I've had several years of suicidal ideation by now. I mean, I'm 30, 31. I wanted to be dead when I was 8. I mean, I, I really feel like I was killed at 8 by this child rape by my brother. I felt very dead after that. By the time I was 10, I really felt dead because of a beating that my mother had given me. And I was like, you just may as well kill me. You've killed me. I'm dead. There's nothing left, right? So now from the age of 10, you know, especially right around, I'd say, 16, 15, 16, even 14, I didn't want to be alive. Right? And I had a lot of suicidal ideation. Never attempted it, but had many opportunities to and actually was thinking about it quite a bit. And so especially if something went wrong, something going down, right? Um, didn't handle things well, couldn't cope, was not shown how to cope, was not shown anything. So you know, I'm carried I'm dealing with a lot. Of, I've got a lot of baggage, you know, a lot of baggage, but I can hold the job down. No problem. I can work. You know, I can get through the day, but relationship stuff, I have no clue. You know, so I leave this guy, right? And uh, I work in Tofino. I'm, I've been in BC for three weeks working. I just lost my baby. I lost my boyfriend because I left him. Moved on out. Got away from him within four hours. 
I'm running away. I ran away from my abusive parents at 29. Now at 30, I'm running away from a man who I thought loved me and he wasn't there for me. So now I'm running again. So I'm in uh, BC, in Tofino, you know, trying to heal from losing this baby, which I'm really glad that I went there because it was very peaceful. It was beautiful. It was serene. I was safe for three weeks to just sit and uh, and really do some, some, some healing, a little bit of healing work, especially from losing the baby. And with a very nice lady and her husband, it was just a nice thing. I'm glad that I did and I was able to do that. I get a call. My mom's sick. She's been in, she's in New Mexico. My, my dad and my, my abuser dad and my abuser mother went to Nova Scotia. The year that I moved, they left a month later. They packed up and they went to Nova Scotia to visit their siblings because they know they're getting old. Everybody's getting old. All their siblings are getting old. Some have already passed on. My aunts and uncles who I really don't know, you know, I don't know the whole Nova Scotia thing. I was born in New Mexico. You know. And, uh, but they go and they want to be with their family. And that's, you know, I mean, I was happy for them that they could do that. And so the, now they come back to New Mexico. My mom gets sick and dies. And I'm sitting, I left off, you know, I'm sitting at the hospital and I'm thinking you know, after, after she passed, you know, they, they actually had pulled the plug and, and uh, we went and they said our goodbyes, you know, and I go outside to have a cigarette, right? And I'm sitting outside on the, on the sidewalk, just sitting in the sun, soaking up the sun, you know. Cause it's nice down there in the springtime in New Mexico. It's just like summer anywhere else in the world. It's hot down there. It's a beautiful, beautiful desert area. It's lovely. So I'm sitting in the sun soaking up some rays, you know. And I'm thinking, my mom's dead. And for the first time in 30 years, it's over. The abuse is over. It will never again hurt me. She will never again be able to hurt me in any way, shape, or form. You know, I'm sad that my mom's dead. I loved my mom so much, you know. But I'm not really crying. Maybe a little bit here and there, but not, you know, nothing. I mean, we we thought we were going to lose her so many times before the hospital would have us come and say goodbye to her, you know, just in case she didn't make it. She was so sick. You know? So, I mean, um, my abuser mother's dead. And uh, we said the right things to her before she went. That was the right thing to do. I was at peace with that. And... Uh, now we just got to deal with my dad, my crazy, mentally ill, psychologically ill, borderline schizophrenic, borderline personality disorder, evil dad. You know what I mean? But he's not so evil anymore. He's old. He's uh, my mom's 68 when she died. He's 72. And he, he has to plan the funeral. OK. And my mom had told me before I moved to Canada that she wanted to be cremated. She did not want to go in the ground. She wanted to be cremated and she wanted a, just a very simple, not even a funeral. She wanted a wake. She wanted people to come like a party in the kitchen and she wanted people to have a good time and music and food, laughter. That's what she wanted for her funeral, right? That's what she said would be the best thing, right? Not people standing around crying about the whole thing, right? Which I thought was cool. I was like, she says, you need to make sure that happens for me, right? Telling me just a few years before I moved to Canada, right? And when one of our conversations... And I'm like, I, I will, I will, because she says, your father, you know, he won't do it. That, you know, she, her, her, her and my dad, of course, they don't ever get along. My dad never does anything he's supposed to. So, you know, she figures he won't do it. I need to do it. So I tell my dad, but he's, he's preparing the funeral here. He's, he's the one that's going to be doing the funeral. And uh, I tell him, I say, he says, well, we're just going to have to go pick out a casket for mom. And I'll have to get a plot. I'll get a plot. He's really upset by this. He just he thinks he's just lost the most precious thing in the world to him. He's acting like his best, most precious prized possession in the whole world has just been taken from him. This is coming from a man who beat and cursed and tortured and raped his wife. Year after year after year after year. <laughs> and uh, the rest of me and me and me, Kathy are sitting there just going. He's, well, we all know he's crazy. But now he's a fucking asshole. Because he's acting like he's so good. Oh, I'm the grieving husband. I lost my wife and I loved her so much. He hated her. They, she hated him and he hated her. She was a whore. She was a harlot. He'd come in from church, you know. He'd come in from church on Sunday and he'd be like, You're a whore. You're a harlot. You're a tramp. And none of these kids belong to me. 
You know, my mom would be like, what the hell are you talking about? She'd be like, I wish they were other people's children, but unfortunately you're, they're yours. And, he, you know, now it'd start to fight. He was always calling her name, slapping her around, raping her, raped her in front of me, right? So, I mean, you know, I'm just going along with my dad. I'm like, let's keep the peace. I'm only going to be here for for a few weeks, you know, while we do this funeral thing, visit with a few people while I'm here, and then, you know, I'm gone, right? So I'm like, keep the peace, keep the peace, right? Well, we go to the funeral. We never should have gone to the funeral home with him. Bad idea. Go to the funeral home. He wants to pick out this casket that's like $10,000. <laughs> And me and Kathy are like, I said, look, mom wanted to be cremated. Oh, no. She told me in Nova Scotia. She told me in Nova Scotia that she wanted to be buried. And we changed all that. And I'm like, well, she told me cremation. And she told me cremation a long time ago because she said you would change it because you don't believe in cremation. So you should be honoring her wishes. And my dad's like, I'm not. I'm doing what she told me to do. And we, he starts to raise his voice because my dad, see, when I was little, at this point, he would have had me up against the wall, and his knuckles would have been in my ribs, and he would have been pushing and shoving, keeping me up against the wall so I can't escape, and he'd been whipping off his belt. I'm a man. I'm going to show you a man. And he'd whip off his belt, and he'd slap me across the face with a belt buckle. Just boom, boom. And I'd be like, as we go again, fuck you. I hate you, you fucking asshole. See, but he's too old. He's 72 years old. So he's in my face as a 72-year-old man. And if he was younger, and I was younger, I'd have been beat for sure. But anyway, I'm telling him, look, let's not fight. You know what I mean? I'm just telling you what she told me. This is all I'm doing. And he's, my dad is psychotic. This is why he beat his wife. He beat his children. See, he's not this nice man. I want everybody to know. This is why I'm telling everybody. This is why I went public with my story. So, you know, I'm like, you're a fucking son of a bitch. I'm like, he, she, you're going to spend 10 grand on a coffin and you wouldn't buy her a fucking thing ever. My dad never, ever, probably because she wouldn't accept it. She would have probably ripped it up into tiny shreds and thrown it in his face, right? That's probably why he didn't buy anything. And we're not thinking this at the time. My dad never bought her anything. Nothing. Nothing. We're talking not a, not a, nothing. Ever. And the only money my mom ever had was the money that she got to make when she finally started working. He sold the house out from under her. You know, beat her kids. Well, she beat her kids too, so. But still, he did. He beat her kids. I'm just like, now you're going to spend 10 grand on a casket and what? Another however much on the funeral to make it look good. So you look like the husband who really gave a shit about her. We're fighting in this funeral hall. Yeah, he's got his voice. As soon as he raised his voice, I raised mine. And I'm like, fuck you. Can't hit me anymore, old fucking man. You know what I mean? You can't kick my ass anymore. You're too fucking old and I'm too old. So too bad. You don't like what I have to say? Tough shit. Here comes the funeral director guy from the funeral place. And he comes in. We got this family fight going on in there. Kathy's just like hiding in the corner. She's like, mm -hmm. I'm not saying anything. I'm not. That's, that's what she always did. She sat on the she sat on the bed doing her homework while my mom was like, you fucking bitch. You fucking goddamn bitch. And my nose broke and blood went up the wall. My mom's beating the shit out of me. Kathy never said a fucking word. Not a fucking word. No, she just sat there. <laughs> you know, that's what she did. That's, that's just what she did. She never said anything. She was the smart one because she never got her ass kicked. Right? So anyway, you know, she's just sitting there quiet. Quite embarrassed probably by this whole thing. Me and my dad are kind of just going at it. I'm like, you're a fucking asshole. You know what I mean? I'm giving it to him. I'm like, fuck you. You know, you fucking screwed mom's life up. And here you are acting like, you know, this is all coming out now. I'm like, I'm just going to let it fly. I'm like, you know, you know, now you want to pretend you're the great husband by putting on a $20,000 funeral. And the, the funeral director guy comes in and he's like, he does a director around and he goes out and he's like, oh shit. 
we're going to have an incident here in the funeral home where all the caskets are. I hope they don't bust anything. And <laughs> so I decide I'm going to calm down because Kathy's like telling me, let's all calm down. Let's all calm down. Right. And I'm like, okay, let's calm down. <laughs> I'm like, dad, spend as much fucking money on this thing as you want. I don't care because mom's dead. It doesn't matter. It's just for her dead body. I said, the thing is, guess what? There's a lot of us that know the truth. You can try putting on a show if you want to, but there's way too many of us that know the real, real reality of the way that you treated our mom. So I'm happy with that. And I leave. I'm like, I'm done. <laughs> as long as I get to get my say in, I'm like, all right, because I could never say anything as a child because I get my ass fucking beat. Right? By him and my mom. What a bunch of shit. You know what I mean? So I, you know, that, that whole thing's all set up now. My dad's planned the whole funeral. Beautiful, beautiful funeral that my mother deserved. It's not really what she wanted. She wanted a party in the kitchen. She wanted cremation. Maybe she changed her mind in Nova Scotia. I really don't know. All I know is it was an absolutely beautiful funeral. It really was. I don't really like funerals. But this one was really well done. And it was nice. There were so many people there. You know, there's just so many people there. This funeral was hard for me because my mother was my abuser. And all these people are like, we're so sorry about your mother. And I'm thinking, well, I'm sorry too, but you know, at least the abuse is over now, right? But I'm not telling them that. So we all sit down in the pews. Of course, the family gets to sit in the front, right? And I'm not sitting next to my dad because I don't want him touching me. I don't like my dad touching me at all. And I used to think... I used to wonder sometimes, I thought, did he sexually abuse me too? And I just don't remember. But actually what it was, it was from the physical abuse, I'm sure of it. Couldn't stand him even sitting next to me, even with the cloth material touching me. You know, because he hurt me. You know what I mean? He, he, he put my hip out of place. Like, he injured me for life. And I mean, you know, he beat on me. Just like my mom. My mom did too. My mom was my main abuser. She did most of the abuse. But my dad had his share. Lots of it. So I didn't want him touching me. No, any rape. See, I also might have to do with the rape. Because, you know, he raped my mom in front of me. Right, when I was six years old. And I couldn't stand to think of, you know, I just I just didn't want him touching me. Right. So I, I move, I'm sitting over here by my nephew. And me and my nephew, Danny. He's just a year and a half, like, younger than me. Because my sister had her children when my mom was pregnant with me. See, cause my sister was 18 years older than me. She got married and leave, left that fucking house. <laughs> got married, had kids, you know. So my nephew's just like a little bit, he's more like a cousin to me. He still calls me Aunt Lori or Aunt Lo, which is weird because I think of him more like a cousin, even though he's my nephew. Right? And uh, we're sitting there, right? And he says to me, <laughs> my nephew, <laughs> it's an open casket. My mom looks beautiful. They have makeup on her. She's got her hair all beautiful, curled. You know, she just looks so peaceful. So peaceful. And my, my nephew says, you know, I've never, ever seen Grandma look so peaceful. Because that's, that's, that's his grandma. I have never, ever seen Grandma look so peaceful before in my entire life. And I'm like, me neither, man. And we start laughing. And we're, but we're trying to be quiet because this is a funeral and like people are crying. <laughs> and, the, and the funeral guy, the, the, the pastor guy who's this funeral, pastor guy who's doing the funeral message, the funeral service, he's trying to do the service, the sermon, like the whole funeral service thing. And he's talking, you know, this woman, you know, she was a mother to so many children, right? And me and my nephew are laughing our asses off. And it's so bad that we can't even control ourselves. People say that happens at funerals, but this wasn't just a nervous reaction. This was because we had never seen my mom look like that. I didn't even recognize her. No, because I'd never seen that look on her face of peace, right? I've never, I'd never seen that, ever. So she, I didn't recognize her. She didn't look like my mother, right? And I, I said, I, we were laughing, and we couldn't stop, so I had to look like I was crying <laughs> because I didn't want people to see me laughing. They would have been, yeah, she is a bitch. She did need her ass kicked when she was a little kid. But, and I'm like, <laughs> so my nephew and me are tucked in like this. and we're for, we, we look like we're crying from the back. 
But we are laughing our asses off. It's terrible. I mean, oh my God. I actually really did feel bad about that, right? Because um, I thought, this is not the time to laugh. You know what I mean? My mom's gone on to heaven. But I was actually really relieved. You know, her life was hell herself. She brought us into her hell. Her and my dad said, you know, when I was brought into the world as a C-section because I was dying in her womb, you know, two and a half months early, three months early. And they said, well, my mom and dad said, and they didn't even name me and they didn't bother changing my name. The nurse named me because they didn't give a shit about me, man. They were like, oh, here's another fucking little piece of shit thing that we have to try to raise. It's like, Jesus. My mom's like, welcome to our hell. Welcome to our hell. So I'm sitting there laughing because I'm like, this has just been such a fucking nightmare, you know? So after the funeral's over, I visit with some people, friends of mine that I haven't seen for a long time, and they all sad for me, thinking that I'm sad about my mother being gone, right? But I'm actually like, I'm at peace. It's cool. She will never be able to dig me ever again. And I'll never have to hear that disdain of, I never wanted you in the first place. You're a goddamn rape child. And you mean nothing to me. And you just stay away from me. I'm going to fucking beat your ass. You know, I had to listen to this shit all the time. I mean, I never really ever got away from it, you know, until the age of 17 when she stopped beating on me. And then it was just digs. Digs, you're a fucking whore. You're such a fucking whore. I wasn't even a fucking whore. She let my brother rape me. What am I supposed to do? I even told her, I said, what am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to get him to stop? Because he's hurting me. And my mom said, wrap yourself like a, up like a mummy at night. Walks out of the room. So then I'm screwed for life because I can't let anybody touch me. You know what I mean? It's like it's un unbelievable what she did to me. So I'm laughing at the funeral, excuse me. You know what I mean? Um, so I go back to Canada. I go back to Canada, but I don't go back to Tofino because I know this could be really difficult to find a place to live there. And uh, housing there is incredibly hard to find. And I did look that up while I was there. Three weeks. I mean, I had three weeks of nothing really to do. So I was checking it out for rentals, finding out what I could rent there. There's nothing. They were like, if you want to sleep in the bush in a tent, that's what a lot of people do. And I thought, hell no. I can just see myself out there. What am I going to do with my tent like during the day when I'm working? Put a padlock on it, you know what I mean? Um, so I was like, no, no, no. So I decided to go to Calgary. And my bro actually knew a lady in Calgary. So my bro was actually very helpful to me, Kevin, and his wife, Anna. They were very helpful to me when I first moved up to Canada when I was 30 years old because, you know, they knew I really didn't kind of have any money to work with. And I wanted to get out of that abusive hellhole that I came from. And they were trying to try and help me out. They knew I didn't have very many life skills and they knew what I was coming from. A house full of fucking garbage, you know? So they did try to help me out and they did a lot of nice things for me. So they hooked me up with a friend of theirs that I actually knew from before because I met her when she came to see my mom when I was like 12 years old or 11 years old, something like this. But I don't, re I just remembered her seeing her when she was young. Now she's an older lady, right? And um, probably like my age now, <laughs> And um, so, I, you know, I'm, I'm like, uh, I stay with her three weeks. I get a job cooking here in Calgary. And that's that's uh, that's really was the quickest job I could think of that I could get quick. Because, you know, cooking jobs, there's lots of them. And if you can cook, you can get a job. The guy's like, you don't have a lot of references. You know, you just in Canada, like, when, what, one year, you know, what have you been doing? Floating around, you're floating around. Because, see, in four months, January, February, March, April, I lost my baby. I left Cecil, so I considered that a loss. It was a loss. I lost my my mom, and I had been moving around with no stability. I, I had no place to really live in four months. But I'm used to adversity. I'm used to getting up off the ground, you know, after beatings, after being thrown against the wall by my dad. You know, it's, I'm used to picking myself up off the ground and saying, okay. We're going, we're going to just get up off the ground, you know, and I'm just going to go damage check, damage control check. <laughs> That's what I do. <laughs> That's what I do. And uh, continue on from there, right? I'm used to this. So I'm not too upset about it. So this, I, I save enough money right away working full time at this restaurant 
And within a month, I've got a place to live. I got my own apartment. And so, I, I, as I go in that apartment, I have nothing except for this nice little white, plastic white resin outdoor patio chair that the lady, the lady that I was staying with, lets me use, which is really nice of her because I didn't have a chair. Uh, my sleeping bag, my clothes, um, my little tiny, little tiny stair radio thing, and my music, and that's it. And uh, I close the door behind me. You know, after she drops me off and I sign all the papers and everything, I get the keys, I go up, I shut the door, and so begins a new chapter of a new nightmare. And this is where we'll leave off with this one. And um, like, I say, like I say, thank you so much for following my work. Thanks for everything you're doing to stop and prevent child abuse. I mean, please get involved. Just if you, even if you don't have children, I don't have children, right? We all know why. And I couldn't adopt, right? I couldn't, couldn't even do foster care. I mean, you know, not enough stability. So, uh, you know, thanks for doing everything you can to help stop and prevent child abuse. Get involved. Be a voice. Make sure the children around you are not being abused. Help a survivor if you can. Just be a friend and ear. Don't say, can't you just get over it? Shouldn't you be over that by now? Was it really that bad? Be an ear, man. Be a shoulder. You know? Be a source of encouragement. You know? And uh, do whatever you can to, to help people out, right? God bless you all. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.